presentation is Women Surgeons of the 19th Century, Ahead of the Times. Our presenter is Danielle Saunders Walsh, MD. Dr. Walsh is a Clinical Associate Professor of Surgery at the Brody School of Medicine. She came to ECU in July of 2011 and specializes in pediatric surgery. She is also the current Vice President of the Association of Women Surgeons. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Walsh. So, women surgeons have been reported as far back as 3,500 BC. Ancient Egyptian paintings on caves and in tombs showed women were actually active in medical training and had formal medical training in Egyptian times. They're shown in those drawings to have performed cesarean sections. And there's even one that shows a woman surgeon resecting a breast cancer way back at that time. Similarly, around the same time frame, there was a Sumerian queen, Shubad, who was actually reported to be a surgeon. There are drawings and art artifacts within her tomb that document her as being a surgeon, and she was even buried with her surgical instruments. Uh, the fourth century uh, BC is one of the times that was a little dark for women surgeons. Women were being accused of doing illegal abortions in addition to their usual surgical practices consisting of C-sections, amputations, drainage of abscesses, and repair of wounds. And they were actually banned as a profession. And there was one Greek surgeon, uh, Agnodice, who's uh, in the drawing here, uh, who cut her hair and dressed as a man to continue practicing. Uh, the, she became very well known as, for a very effective treater and uh, was a treater of many of the wives of very high-ranking officials within the Greek government. And it's the wives who actually saved her career. Uh, she, they essentially pulled rank and forced their husbands not to punish her and actually pushed and got the laws amended that they were allowed to continue treating women, but they could only treat women. They could not treat men. Moving into the 11th century, Salermo was a big center of the revival of medical learning. So medicine and surgery sort of shifted back into an apprenticeship model. And then in Salerno, there was sort of a revival of having formal medical education. And this is the next era in which women were allowed to actually formally train in medicine. They were allowed to t att attend the lectures, and some of them even wrote books at that time. Of the 3,000 uh, licensed physicians in that area, uh, at that time, 18 of them were issued to women. The women were required to complete formal courses and actually take an examination in order to get their license. Moving into the 12th century, most of the medical care was by the monks, the, the religious orders, although we do believe some nuns were active in the role as well. In, the, in that century, though, the church banned the religious from performing actual surgical procedures. And so they ended up teaching a lot of the lay people how to perform the procedures, and the barbers and the women were the ones who did the actual operations. They increasingly, through the next few centuries, were requiring licenses and exams to practice again. And in 1330, France actually prohibited women from practicing surgery unless they were examined by a jury. And none of the men who were on the jury would allow the women to be examined, and therefore there were very few to any uh, women who did. Those who did try and continue practicing their trade were even arrested and excommunicated. Moving into the medieval times, uh, there was a, a king uh, in Naples who uh, issued a license, and he used the term Mahistra Surgique, so indicating that this was a woman surgeon. It was the only woman in that area who ever got a license, but it was well documented, and this is a, an image of that king. Uh, he was a fairly corrupt guy, and so there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of um, uh, supposition that, that she bought her license, uh, but apparently she did practice and she had a very active uh, and profitable practice in the area. The 1400s to 1600s brought another dark period of time for women surgeons, uh, primarily because of the witch hunts and the, feel, the uh, concern about witchcraft and sorcery in, in much of Europe. Uh, this proved deadly for many women practitioners, especially midwives. There was a prevailing theory that if a baby died while the midwife was attending the birth, uh, that the midwife was actually trying to collect the child for Satan. Uh, and this often led to the death of the midwife herself. Uh, and then those who did practice were usually required to do written oaths to the, uh, the local priests and, and clerics to uh, swear not to use sorcery during their procedures or deliveries. The term surgeoness first appeared around 1600 or so. 
uh, and there's a report of a Mrs. Holder uh, in England who treated King Charles II for a hand injury, and much to the grief of all the surgeons who envy and hate her, uh, he healed completely. Of note, in England, uh, surgeons are referred to by Mr. and Mrs. as opposed to doctor, like we use in the US. So regular physicians in Europe, uh, in England in particular, are referred to as doctor, but surgeons uh, keep them Mr. and Mrs. Uh, this entered a period of time where women actually had to pretend to be a man if they were going to practice, and one of the well-reported cases of that from the early 1800s was Dr. James Barry. Uh, Dr. James Berry took his uh, or her examinations very early at the age of 18 uh, and uh, joined the military and was a British Army surgeon at the Battle of Waterloo and the Crimean Wars. And it was only when he died that it was revealed that he was actually a she. Um, the body was prepared for burial and it was a, a great uh, scandal in the country that, that, that this well-known, well-respected surgeon was actually a woman. Moving into the Victorian times, the time we're going to focus on today, there was uh, an intense involvement of women in colonial health care. Uh, but then moving into the 1800s, very few of them had any type of formal education. This really was an apprenticeship model. And most of the women who practiced surgery were children or daughters of surgeons in the area. And that's how they learned their trade and carried it out. But the 1800s brought the introduction of medical schools to the United States, and most of them were for profit. These were not university endeavors early on. And so there was a, then a transition of a needing to attend medical school and get a certificate, and it went on to become a profession requiring an education instead of just this apprenticeship model that most women had trained under. Also at this time, it was very prosperous. And with the prosperity, there was a rise in the number of women who were becoming educated. They didn't have to work in the fields anymore. They were being educated in the home, usually, occasionally attending small schools. And they came from upper middle class families. And uh, they would get a hold of a medical textbook and develop an interest in medicine. However, the prevailing notions of the time prevented many of them from pursuing any interest in medicine. First, the women were perceived to be feeble-minded. They was thought that they, being a physician was really beyond their intellectual capacity. And then they felt that physically, they really couldn't handle it either, that their skeletons, their minds, and even their character were solely for the purpose of reproduction and support of a family and raising children. Uh, and it was almost an economic model where if you spent your energy one way, you might deplete it from another. So there was a belief that if you pursued other things such as education and medicine, that you might actually drain energy from the body that would result in less than successful motherhood. They also felt that there was an additional weakness and mental fluctuation that occurred with menstruation and for up to a year after childbirth. And there was even a suggestion by some authors that uh, women physicians might be tempted to kill their children after they're born in order to be able to get back to practicing medicine because they wouldn't want to uh, dedicate their time to their family. Men in general were concerned that higher education risked uh, de-sexing the women, that the women were be would become less feminine with time, and also that with the close contact with men that they would uh, corrupt themselves and, and become uh, uh, less virtuous. They were felt to be too delicate to really handle the physical requirements of clinical practice, in particular surgery. Uh, and they thought that the revolting details of practicing medicine were just not compatible with the femininity or the feminine mind or character. They were concerned that women couldn't travel safely at night to handle surgical emergencies. And more importantly, they actually viewed them as an economic threat. The concern that most women were going to end up wanting a woman surgeon was uh, enough for them to want to protect their pocketbooks. The women who were actually physicians in surgery of that time did write that they had poor health uh, but that, and they were overworked, but that they worked very hard to actually write studies to document their good health in order to try and disprove to the men in society that they could handle being physicians. Most felt that becoming a physician and a surgeon had actually saved their lives. They were delivered from the confinement and uselessness of the daily life of a Victorian woman. It felt that permitted them to use their strengths and talents, especially in an intellectual and a technical perspective. Most women physicians would focus on hygiene and prevention as opposed to the cure sought by men. So men wanted to actually fix the problem and women wanted to prevent the problem. Uh, and so they did develop slightly different focuses around this time. But because most surgeons are curers, not preventers, and not into hygiene quite as much, a woman surgeon was an even greater anomaly at this time of poor acceptance of women physicians. <laughs> 
The, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, glass floor, I would say, was broken by Elizabeth Blackwell, who's well reported to be the first woman to graduate from an actual medical school in the United States in 1949. She was a teacher and had been a teacher for about 15 years, and uh, she became very interested in medicine, read medical books, and actually did a semi-apprenticeship with the man who went on to become the president of the American Medical Association. He wrote her a letter of recommendation, and on her second attempt applying to medical school to Geneva Medical College, she was accepted, much to her own surprise. It turns out that at Geneva Medical School, the students were allowed to vote to decide who got accepted. And when her application came forward, the students were convinced that this was a hoax. And so they unanimously accepted it, laughed it off, walked away, didn't think much about it, and then she got her acceptance letter, and lo and behold, she was not taking any chances. Less than three weeks from the day she was accepted, she showed up at Geneva Medical School ready to start. And uh, it was quite a shock to both the students and the faculty, uh, but she had her letter and nobody wanted to be the bad guy and tell her it was a hoax. And so they let her start and she went on to finish. However, getting your medical degree did not really equivalent to practicing. So as soon as she got out, she found that no hospital was going to give her privileges. Uh, most uh, leasers of property were not willing to rent her office space to even open a practice, and certainly no man was willing to take her on as their partner at the time. So she left the United States and actually went to Paris, and there she worked as a nurse mi midwife and uh, actually became more of a physician working in obstetrics in one of the Parisian hospitals. Around that time, she was taking care of a child. The child had a bad eye infection. She was washing out the eye. The fluid from the eye that she was washing out splashed into her own eye. She developed a terrible eye infection, lost most of her sight in that eye, and therefore was never able to become the surgeon that she had intended to become in the beginning. So she was not our first surgeon, but she was someone who had aimed to be a surgeon and had kind of broke the barrier to women being accepted into medical school in the United States. She eventually moved back to the United States and founded not only a medical school, but also a hospital for training women physicians. So her, her dedication to developing women physicians persisted. Some of the medical establishments that, that went on to train uh, women, 19, uh, 1848, um, the New England Female Medical College opened primarily to train midwives. They did not want the men to have to examine or work with women, so they, it was created a separate institution where these women could come and train to be midwives. That transitioned into a full medical school with a true internship where they did rotations in obstetrics and gynecology, psychiatry, um, surgery, and internal medicine, not terribly dissimilar to what our third year students do today. In 1950, the Female Medical College of Pennsylvania was created by charter from the state of Pennsylvania. It was subsequently renamed, but it was the first regular medical school for women. It opened its doors to 20 women that year, and I believe it was six that graduated a year and a half later. Even when these women were coming out, though, there were many barriers to success. The uh, established physicians of the city were not willing to refer patients to the women. They were highly discriminated against. Again, they had difficulty opening practices. And they were having trouble getting the women who were in medical school exposed to actual patients so they could get additional training because the hospitals wouldn't let them in. And this led to the development of the Women's Hospital of Philadelphia. So one of the first woman graduates of the hospital, um, of the medical school, actually came from a well-to-do family. They rented a space, created a women's and children's hospital, and ultimately built their own building. The medical school is pictured on the left there, and the actual hospital that was built explicitly for women to train in was, uh, is to the right there. Um, one of those students was a woman named Anna Elizabeth Brumall, and uh, again, they had trouble getting access to training. So the dean of this Women's College of, of uh, Pennsylvania had made an arrangement with the Pennsylvania Hospital that they were going to allow the women students to attend lectures, at least held there, even though they wouldn't interact with patients. There were nine women in that group who went to that very first lecture, and they had a, they had a bad day. Uh, they were hooted at, there were cat calls, and they were pelted with spitballs, the very first lecture that they arrived at. And ultimately, at the end of the lecture, they were physically chased from the building from the male students who were unwilling to be educated alongside them. Despite this, the women returned each and every week, and over time, the cat calls and the, the abuse receded, and eventually, by the end of the year, several of the students had received apologies. <laughs> 
Despite that, uh, the discrimination that was occurring, the women who did go into surgical fields and did uh, embrace uh, physical uh, training were very much like the men in what they reported as their experiences and how they described it. Uh, Edith Flower Wheeler went on to become a, a gynecologic surgery, and when she was training and dissecting, she once wrote in her, in her journal, I did a laparotomy, which is an incision to open the abdomen. I did a laparotomy on a patient today, a dead one, had lots of fun, succeeded in poking holes in everything that I ought not to. If my patient hadn't been dead to start with, she would have been deader than a doornail by the time I got through. It's identical to what the male students would, it's identical to what you'd hear from a medical student today who's doing their first laparotomy on a cadaver or even in an operating room, although ideally they're not making those holes. <laughs> um, the harassment did not uh, consist just of medical school and training aspects. Once they got out, they still had a really rough go of it. There was a, a, a surgeon named Mary Dixon Jones. She was actually a pioneering gynecologic surgeon. And she also had to found her own hospital, along with her son, called the Women's Hospital of Brooklyn. In 1888, she, she uh, was made quite famous by front page news, both in medical journals and in regular newspapers. She did a hysterectomy for a 17 pound tumor that was removed. And the patient not only survived, um, but was actually up and doing well 15 days after the surgery. Now this is a pre-antibiotic era, and it's also pre-sterility. So surgery was a really big deal. About 70 to 80% of people who even went under surgery died, and they died from infection and, and asepsis. So the fact that this woman had a, a big operation like this, didn't get sick, and survived it was, was really quite a feat. A lot of the other physicians in the area became jealous, and some of them started writing some anonymous letters to the newspaper called The Eagle. In 1889, The Eagle was the largest newspaper in New York, and it was part owned by a physician who was actually a competitor. And there were several articles that were very critical of the finances of the hospital that she ran, and then the surgeon itself. And they continued to go on and get more and more critical until ultimately she had two charges of manslaughter and eight malpractice suits brought against her uh, in connection with the reports of these articles. This led to a two-year trial, and at the end of the two-year trial, she was absolved of all charges. However, the newspaper kept publishing negative articles about her, including the trial, and so she finally sued them for libel. The libel suit did not go quite as well, though. She did lose that and ultimately decided she was going to close her practice and went on to publish primarily pathologic textbooks using a lot of the specimens she had obtained from the operations that she did. One of the other surgeons I want to spend a little bit more time about is a lady named Mary Edwards Walker. Now, I had never heard of Mary Edwards Walker until nine months ago. And I went down to uh, Fort Macon, and when I was in the gift shop, I saw this stamp that said, Mary, Mary Walker, Army Surgeon Medal of Honor. Number one, I was not aware of any women who had won the Medal of Honor. And number two, I was not aware of any 18th century women surgeons, especially ones in the Army. And so this intrigued me, and I started looking into her, and I was surprised to find she was one of the first in the U.S. ever. And she's the only woman who's ever received the Congressional Medal of Honor, and that she was not only a surgeon, but she was a spy and a prisoner of war in the Civil War. So a little bit more about her. She was born in 1932 in Oswango, New York, which was a small town. Her father, Alvia, had moved there to become a farmer. He'd previously been a carpenter and traveled much of the country. Her father was a very intelligent and curious kind of guy. So he had a lot of books, including medical textbooks. And in fact, he was the person in that local community that gave most of the care to the people on the farm. So he would suture their lacerations. He would set broken bones. And Mary was with him and learned from the textbook, much like the apprentice model we discussed before. Her father was also um, a very uh, politically active guy. Their home served as one of the stops on the Underground Railroad on the way up to Canada. And uh, because he expected his daughters, all five of them, to work on the farm, he forbid them from wearing corsets and tight dresses. And uh, that became a very important thing to Mary as time went on. As a young adult, she became a teacher, like, much like most women in her time. Uh, she was hired in the, a city about five miles away in 1952 and worked for several years in upstate New York. During that time, she became active in the abolitionist movement as well as the women's rights movement. She was writing for a magazine at the time as well as giving orations on the topic. 
Three years after Blackwell had graduated from Geneva, which was only 50 years later, she announced that she wanted to go to medical school. And she saved her money up from teaching and in fact applied and was uh, accepted to medical school. She went to Syracuse Medical School starting in December of 1853. The school was a fairly new school. It was only two years old. And like many of the others, it was for profit. Now, it turned out Syracuse was having great difficulty attracting students at that time because it was what's called an eclectic medical school. So there were what we call allopathic ones that used a lot of uh, amputations and um, mer mercury compounds and aggressive cures. Uh, and then there were more homeopathic ones that included herbalism and some of the other techniques at the time. Eclectic was theoretically going to combine homeopathic medicine, herbals, and allopathic, but it hadn't really caught on yet. So they accepted her as long as she could pay her dues, and it was $55 per term. In order to graduate, you had to complete three terms. Each term was 13 weeks, and they were identical. So you did 13 weeks. 13 weeks, 13 weeks with the same professors, same topics, same things, and at the end of that you got a degree. Wasn't a very good medical school, but that's what they had. In theory, they opposed bloodletting, which was still done fairly commonly at that time. Creation of blistering, purgatives, mercurics, and all of those things that they felt caused damage to the body as opposed to healing it. She was the only woman to graduate in her class. After graduation, she ran into the same problems as, as uh, Elizabeth Back Blackwell. Physicians were considered quacks if they were women. Uh, they was felt they didn't know their biblical place in society. They were invading the male domain. And her physical state didn't really help. She was less than five feet tall, and she only weighed about 100 pounds uh, soaking wet. So she was a very diminutive woman, uh, and her physical stature didn't really help her stand up to some of the, the men in the time. In addition, because she'd never worn corsets and never worn dresses, she dressed very unconventionally, and in fact, she was very active in dress reform. So here's a woman who is trying to practice medicine, specifically practice surgery. She wears pants, and she's really tiny. Um, but she had a very adventurous spirit. In fact, she wrote that when she graduated from medical school, her goal was to go to Europe and be a surgeon in the Crimean War. However, she graduated late in 1955. The war ended in 1956, and she never quite made it that way. What she did next is she went to uh, Cincinnati for a time, which is where the home of eclectic medicine was, but they too weren't willing to accept women physicians. And ultimately, one of her classmates, Albert Miller, had set up a practice in Rome, New York, and he sent her a letter and said, I'd like you to come back and practice with me. So she did, and she uh, noted in her practice she was pulling teeth, delivering babies, lancing boils, and repairing wounds. She married him less than two months after she returned there. In her wedding ceremony, there were no vows of obedience, and she did, in fact, wear pants at the same time. She uh, used a hyphenated name, which was very forward for a time, never used just Miller, but she would use Walker Miller, and, and most of the time in her professional life, just Walker. Unfortunately, her husband had very liberal ideas on fidelity and was known to take several other women on within a year of her marriage. So she filed for divorce because she was not going to put up with his fraternizing. Uh, but the courts were unwilling to grant divorces around that time, particularly to women who filed for divorce. And so she couldn't get a court to approve her divorce until almost five years later. During this time, especially after she had separated from her husband, she became even more active in the reform movement, especially the dress movement with her writing and oration. In, at the onset of the Civil War, she found her calling. When the Civil War broke out, she immediately uh, sent letters down to Washington, D.C., asking for a commission to be appointed as an army surgeon. And on multiple occasions, she was refused. She even made several trips down to Washington, D.C. to beg for the commission and was still refused. So finally, she traveled down to Washington, D.C., and at times right at the end of the Battle of Bull Run. And she, they were overwhelmed with uh, patients everywhere, sitting in tents, overtaking every building possible. And she just volunteered as an assistant surgeon. She had absolutely no pay, but she figured this was her best way of getting in with the surgeons there. She uh, continued that for almost a year until the number of casualties went down and she still hadn't been paid. Um, so she decided that part of the problem was her degree being from this eclectic school. So she thought if she got a second medical degree, she'd improve, improve her stature. So she went up to New York and actually got a second MD degree from a different school in hopes that she would be able to get a position now in the Army. 
That didn't work out so well either. But in 1862, the Battle of Antonium occurred and she took a train and went right on into the battlefield. And she literally started pulling patients off, patients off the field and uh, bringing them into the field house, operating on them, caring for them. And they were so overwhelmed, they were happy to have her sources, but they weren't gonna give her a commission and she didn't get paid for any of it. Ultimately, she did befriend some of the generals there and she actually got uh, given a letter allowing her to take injured soldiers directly to Washington. And this was done primarily because they had no water, they had no food, they had no medical supplies, and the only way she was gonna get any care for them was to actually take them to Washington, D.C. So they commandeered a train and she filled six cars of the train with as many wounded as she can, and only two of them died in the, the several day journey up to Washington. She went on and also did the same thing for the Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, there she did a little bit better. She was actually given rations. They gave her her own tent. And at that time she sat down and sewed a modified uniform for herself. She uh, accompanied it by the green sash and the green sash was the sine qua non of a surgeon on the battlefield. So she distinguished herself with this unique uniform and identified herself as a surgeon despite having no commission and no pay. She did the same thing. She again was an adventurous person, went to Chattanooga, and there she hit just at the time where the casualties from the Battle of Chickamauga were arriving. Uh, and the, from a medical perspective, we don't know quite as much about her. We know that she was opposed to most amputations. She felt that amputations were being way overused and that some of these patients really didn't require it. And when she felt that way, she would actually encourage the patient to refuse to have surgery. Um, there are, however, some news reports of her doing skilled amputations, so she must have done some, but she was a little bit more selective than other surgeons. She refused to do bloodletting. She refused to apply mercury because she thought it was poison. Turns out she was right. And she had a great emphasis on comfort, nutrition, and herbals to allow the patient to improve from surgery on their own. She finally did get her appointment. So. Um, Suddenly, one of the assistant surgeons uh, of the 52nd Ohio Infantry died. And despite their best efforts for three weeks, they could not find anyone who would come take over this position. General George Thomas had met her when she had been at Antonium previously. And uh, he actually finally sent her a letter and asked if she would come. And she did, in fact, report right away. And she actually got her commission as an acting assistant surgeon in a civilian contract surgeon position. Now, most acting assistant surgeons uh, from the, from the non-military life who were gonna be commissioned in the army were also given the title of first lieutenant. They were unwilling to give her a military title and so they gave her this civilian contract surgeon. But she didn't care, she had her commission and she was gonna get paid for what she did. Um, she was unique because she was a woman. She actually would often uh, get on horseback and cross over enemy lines and treat civilians, especially women and children, and Union soldiers that she would find on the other side. She also, in that role, was able to pick up a lot of information and served a little bit of sub subterfuge. She was a, a spy on the side. However, one day in April 1960, uh, 1864, she took a wrong turn on horseback and she ended up being captured by the Confederate troops. They uh, initially moved her to Georgia and then transferred her to Richmond's Castle Thunder Prison. For those of you that are familiar with the Civil War prisons, they were not a good place to be. They had very little food, they were infested with vermin, and while she was there, she developed a significant eye infection. And because of that eye infection, she actually was not able to practice much surgically afterwards. In August, several months later, she was tra traded for a Confederate surgeon, and she was quite proud of the fact that she was prominent enough as a surgeon to be traded for another surgeon in, a, in an exchange of prisoners. She did continue her time with the military. She was assigned to Louisville uh, as a head of a hospital and in more administrative roles for another year and a half before she finally ended her service in June of 1965. This is an image of the prison that she was in. It was an old warehouse that was converted to a prison. She was bestowed the Congressional Medal of Honor by President Johnson in November 11th of 1865. She had many photographs of her taken with it. It was her most prized possession, and from the day she got it till the day she died, she never took it off. After the war, she did get a lot of attention because she was the first woman who ever had received a Medal of Honor. And she ended up going on a lecture circuit because again, she's not able to operate because of the eye infection that she developed. So she traveled throughout England for the most part, parts of Europe, and then eventually came back to the United States 
where she continued working with the suffrage movement and the women's dress movement. However, the suffrage movement actually didn't want her. She was quite eccentric. She was in a man's occupation. She dressed like a man. You can see she's gone from the sort of dress with, with uh, bloomers and pants now to full masculine attire. And they thought that her uh, eccentricity and her dress were actually harmful to the movement. So they got angry at her, she got angry at them, and eventually she separated ways and no longer worked in the suffrage movement, although she still believed in it very strongly. She continued to be a very aggressive, firecracker, adventure-seeking kind of woman. She was arrested in New York for disorderly conduct for dressing as a man, and it was all over the papers and all over the press, and eventually they had to let her go. Um, she applied for a military pension and was denied. Uh, she interviewed and wanted to be hired for the Department of Treasury as a clerk. And she actually was given the letter saying she was hired. She was told where to report, when to report, and she showed up daily for two years, not getting paid because the Secretary of the Treasury refused to actually sign the appointment. So, you know, not too many people shine up, sign up, show up every day for two years not getting paid to make a point. But this is the kind of woman she was. Uh, she eventually did get uh, the Department of Interior to sign an appointment. She was transferred to their mailroom, and uh, she was fired after several years. She fought the firing for years trying to get her position back and ultimately uh, just ticked off a lot of congressional people trying to, trying to work against the system. They got so angry that in 1917, she was one of the people that they revoked her Medal of Honor. They said that she, there was insufficient evidence to support heroic battlefield efforts, despite the fact that she was well reported to march right out onto the battlefield and pull patients off. She appealed, she sent lots of documentation, but the review committee refused to even review the documentation. And so it was refused and they asked for her medal back. She of course refused to give the medal back and she continued to wear it daily. She uh, continued her frequent visits to Congress to get her honor restored, her pension restored, her job restored, and one day she actually tripped and fell on the steps of Congress. Uh, she never really recovered from that, and she died in 1919 at the age of 86, a year before her cherished 19th Amendment was passed. However, time heals, and the Medal of Honor was actually reinstated in 1977 by President Carter, because of the overwhelming evidence that had been maintained in her case. She remains the only woman, of honor, a woman ever to get the Medal of Honor, and most of this was pushed through by her great-grandniece, Ann Walker. She now has an exhibit, which Ann Walker is featured in front of, that's at the uh, entrance to Arlington National Cemetery in the Women in Military Service Memorial. There has been gradual, there was gradual acceptance of women surgeons following the Civil War, largely because increasing numbers of women did go on to become both physicians and surgeons. And the universities of Michigan and Iowa were particularly on the forefront of admitting women to their medical schools. Others followed largely after the Civil War because most of their charters obliged them to provide co-education. So they had sort of a minimum 5%. They would allow up to about 5% of their classes to become women. And there were even some African-American women who were able to become doctors. There's one pictured at the bottom of this photograph from Philadelphia. True surgery residency, where you got out of practice and were able to apprentice to a hospital explicitly as a surgeon, didn't really begin until after the Civil War in the 1889 periods. John Hopkins had the first formal surgery residency, and it was 12 years later that the very first woman was accepted into one at Governor's Hospital in New York City. She did not have it easy, though. They made sure she had the worst assignments of patients, that she had the worst call schedule, and that uh, when any anytime she would walk onto the floor to see her patients, all of the male physicians would walk off the floor. So she couldn't talk to them. She couldn't get updates from them. They would not communicate with her. And in fact, they got to a point where they wouldn't write the diagnosis at the bedside so that she would have to figure it out new for each patient she was covering. Despite that, she went on to finish in practice. Organized medicine was a little bit better than organized surgery. Um, by 1881, there were seven medi 17 medical societies who had accepted women. North Carolina was actually the fourth of those to accept it quite early on in 1872. It wasn't until 1913 that the American College of Surgeons actually admitted about five women to the college, and they went on to allow about one or two a year for the first 20 years. 
Um, women went on to form their own women's organizations, primarily alumni based, because again, they had their own medical schools, their Women's College of uh, New, uh, New England, Women's College in, in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and so most of them formed alumni organizations that became the women's organizations. Um, the, uh, in 1915, they formed the American Medical Women's Association, and this was actually opposed by many of the women physicians of the time. Their, their thinking was that if they formed their organization, they were going to be separatists, and what they really wanted to do was become integrated into the regular organizations at the time. Uh, however, that didn't work out so well. In 1910, the American Medical Association decided it was going to reform medical education. And this was a good thing because there were all these nonprofit schools. There were the eclectic medicines and homeopathic. And there really wasn't good consistency on what it meant to have a medical degree. So after a long study, they had this report that resulted in a standardization of what was going to be necessary to become an accredited medical school but it led to the closure of most of the women's institutions because the women's institutions didn't have the funding to create the reports, create the documents, alter their curriculum, hire the people, and even add the components of research that were necessary to become accredited by the AMA. So the women's specific institutions closed and that led to a significant decrease in the number of women physicians and surgeons who came out. The number of women physicians steadily declined all the way through the 1950s, stayed a little bit stable between the 1950s and 1970s, and then finally started to rise again in the late 70s. At the same time, uh, there was a transition in how medical care was being given. So it went from seeing patients in their home or having a small office to really to a hospital-based practice. And most of the hospitals weren't going to let the women physicians practice there anyhow. They wouldn't give them credentials. They wouldn't give them privileges. And so they couldn't really keep care of their patients. And it, it limited their ability to succeed. In particular, it hurt women surgeons because you can't really do as many operations at home as you can do in a hospital. So where are we now? So we had this increase in the 1970s. By 1910, there are 5% of all women physicians, uh, all physicians were women. There are no specific statistics on how many of them were actually practicing surgery, but it would be a very small number, less than 5% of probably this 7,000 that's here. By 2010, just a year and a half ago, 30, 33%, 34% of all physicians are women. Only about 20% of all surgeons are women though. We're still a fairly small number. However, in the main arena, medical students are now 50% women and about 35% of surgery residents are women. So we anticipate that this number is going to continue to increase. There are still a lot of issues for women surgeons though. There is definitely a glass ceiling. 35% of men surgeons and only 10% of women surgeons will ever attain full professorship. They estimated for the women to catch up to the men at the current rate, it would take until the year 2096 or so for us to catch up. Uh, and some of it's, it, we still have a difficult time with work-life balance, both for men and women, but in particular, mothers have a difficult time. A lot of hospitals don't offer childcare yet. Uh, if things, if your child gets sick, it's very difficult sometimes to manage the child and take care of the operations that you have scheduled. It's very, uh, it's a, there's a lot of uh, idiosyncrasies that are unique to surgeons that make it somewhat difficult. Maternity leave continues to be a problem. So when women first started going back into surgery in the 1970s, it was, you can be a surgeon, but don't marry. Single moms, I mean, they, single, not even moms, single women. They really didn't have a home life. Then they said, all right, well, it transitioned to, there were married women who became surgeons, but they didn't have kids. And then the next generation was, well, they had kids, but only after training. And now our current generation is saying, well, we're gonna have kids while we're in our surgical residency training. And I have to admit, I'm one of the early ones who had a kid during surgery residency training. Um, there's still difficulty with the academic tracks. Uh, you have a set amount of time to get your tenure, and if you step off of that track for the mommy period of time, in many institutions, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get back on. Women surgeons continue to have lower surgery uh, lower salaries than men do, and it's not explained by hours or work experience. Uh, even if you standardize those, a woman surgeon makes about 11% uh, less than a man surgeon. Harassment continues to be an issue. 
Dr. Sagan Tooley was a spine neurosurgeon at Brigham and Women's Hospital. She started there in the year 2000, and she sued uh, her boss and the institution for defamation and harassment in 2007. She was not promoted to division chief after all the other spine surgeons left, and she was the only one there. When she asked about the position, she was told by the department chief that he had a guy in mind for the job. She had lower pay than uh, surgeons with similar experience and skills in her division. The department chair asked her to dance on a table to show women residents how to perform like a girl at the graduation ceremony of the residents. Uh, he commented publicly to a bunch of nurses, oh, girls can do spine surgery. And then he demanded a psychiatry evaluation when she applied for hospital privilege reappointment because of her aggressive nature. She sued, and in 2009, a $1.6 million award was uh, given to her, and it was upheld on appeal in 2011. So those same suits that Mary Dixon faced in New York City uh, a century ago, unfortunately, still occur in our decade. Uh, similarly, women have banded together in organizations. The Association of Women Surgeons just had its 30-year anniversary. It's only existed for 30 years in modern surgical time. We have about 1,800 members, and our goal is to promote the professional and personal success of women surgeons via mentorship and leadership development. Our founder is one surgeon, a breast surgeon named Pat Newman, and ironically, she is the current president of the American College of Surgeons. She's the second woman ever elected to that position. The first was a, 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 a pediatric surgeon who was also a member of the Association of Women Surgeons. She was one of its early members, although not its founding member. There are two other women's surgery organizations that we know of uh, in other countries. Uh, uh, WIS, W-I-S, is in the United Kingdom. It was just formed in 2007. And then the, I happen to like the title JAWS, the Japanese Association of Women Surgeons, was just founded last year from a number of Japanese women who used to come to our meeting here in the United States. There are also some sp subspecialty organizations. There's the Ruth Jackson Society, which is an organization of about 100 women who are orthopedic surgeons in the country. There's a vascular women's surgery group as well. And this year, we will probably formalize the creation of a pediatric surgery women's group. Why do women go into surgery? We find it challenging. It's not only a cerebral field and the management of the patient that's critically ill, but also a technical skill. You get immediate gratification. So as opposed to an internist where we say they prescribe something and they have to wait and see what the results are, we operate. We know they have appendicitis. We cut out the appendix. We're done. At the end, we know they're going to be cured. We're going to be good. So we like that immediate gratification. Most of us are a mix of an introvert and an extrovert. Uh, we like our quiet time in the operating room where we get to focus on something and, and then we're extra extroverted enough that we can uh, round on patients and teach and do those kind of things. So it's a unique personality type that goes into it, or a unique personality type, at least of women that go into it. Uh, you have to have a certain amount of bravado uh, to become a woman surgeon. You have to be confident that you're going to make somebody better. Uh, it is not for the faint of heart that you say to somebody, I'm going to take you in the operating room, I'm going to cut you open, I'm going to move all your organs around or take things out and put things back together, close you up, and it's going to be okay. Um, there's a certain, certain character that has to do that. Uh, it requires a certain amount of leadership skills to be able to lead a team through an operation like that. Uh, we enjoy our scientific endeavors, and many are very active in uh, basic science research. Most of us love to teach, and more importantly, we love patient care. As opposed to regular surgeons, when you survey them, 82% of women surgeons say they would choose the same career over and over again. Um, I particularly like the patient care component to it. This is actually a set of twins. I'm using this uh, on my own of, uh, with permission from the family. This is a set of twins, um, uh, the Buckle twins uh, that were Siamese conjoined twins. And as my graduation from fellowship, I got to be part of separating these two. Mary Walker once said, it's the times which are behind me. And I think that unfortunately still holds true in the field of surgery. Women surgeons still tend to be uh, uh, adventuresome, unique characters in a very male-dominated world. But we're growing, and we're getting bigger, and we're getting better. And uh, more and more women are going into the field, and we're very excited about where it comes. goes from here. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions. I just have a quick question. I mean, as, a, as a surgeon, where did you find time to do this kind of research? <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, it's a passion of yours. Um, you mean the historical research? Yes. Well, you know, my dad's a history teacher. So um, 
uh, the whole theory of history repeats itself and, and the importance of history in our lives has always been just sort of a daily part of the dinner table conversation. So I'll have to, I'll have to give credit to my dad for instilling a, a love of history and a respect for history. Um, the, the time for it is, uh, is by the good graces of my husband and family allowing me to, to pursue something I love. Um, in my spare time and, and the library here has been wonderful. There's actually a number of books uh, that are available both at the Lapis Library and at the Joyner Library that cover um, Mary, uh, Mary Edwards Walker and some of the other pioneer women and women surgeons in the country. Um, and uh, I guess that's, that's where it comes from. When you say 35% of the uh, residents are surgical residents, is that just general surgery and subspecialties, or is that obstetrics and gynecology, which is also sub a surgical specialty? That does not include obstetrics and gynecology. That's within the American College of Surgeons database, and most of them do join the American College of OBGYN as opposed to the American College of Surgeons, so that wouldn't include most of their numbers. If you included them in the surgical subspecialty, it would rise dramatically. But they have a different world. There are actually more women in OBGYN currently than there are men. And most of their training programs are 80 to 90% women. So the environment that a woman is working in in that particular surgical field is very different than the environment that a general surgeon or even a pediatric surgeon is working in where it's still very male dominated. So it's a different experience. I guess I'm sort of shocked by the vitriol that these women experienced when you would think if, if men were saying they're the, the fairer sex, you think they might just try to nicely talk them out of it. But wow, I, I just, that, a real strange dynamic, I think. I think a lot of it was the competitiveness. It was really seen as a threat. And uh, for most of these women, nursing wasn't really an option yet. So a lot of women go into nursing right now. I mean, it's a lot more even socially acceptable or common for a woman to say she's a nurse than to say she's a surgeon, okay? Um, but even at that time, this was, this was early Dorothea Dix, this was early Florence Nightingale, I mean, Florence Nightingale was in the Crimean War era too, if I remember correctly. And so there wasn't another outlet for interest in medicine because nursing wasn't a real profession at that time. I think some of the decline that we saw in women physicians in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s was not only the close of medical schools, but many women who had a tremendous interest in uh, medicine and that attraction to uh, supportive care and uh, preventive care went into nursing and built this tremendous successful you know field of practice that we have today so i think that probably siphoned off a lot of women who may have considered becoming physicians but yeah it was a pretty angry time i i <laughs> I wish I could, uh, in some ways, I love being a surgeon and I, I've been very fortunate to be fairly well accepted in the circles I've been in. Uh, I did my residence training at Massachusetts General Hospital. That is still a very big male bastion. But I had very supportive men and a few women who were within the department who really made sure that I could pull off this whole trick of being a mom and being a surgical trainee at the same time. Not every institution in this country really has come to that comfort level yet. And we still meet with far more discrimination than you would get. The overt discrimination is mostly over. It's more the covert uh, discrimination, uh, not getting nominated to be in committees, not ascending to leadership roles that really plays a bigger role in the problem of women surgeons now. Um, recently, the woman, the, the controversy, I showed you the picture of Pat Newman, who's the current president of the American College of Surgeons. She was president, uh, vice president. She was actually supposed to be president next year, not the current year. And uh, the guy who was president-elect went on and published an editorial for, uh, in February of last year, in which he um, discussed and extolled the benefits of semen on the vagina in an editorial about how sex was better than chocolates for Valentine's Day. 
really? You know, 2011, really? Yeah, yeah. And so he lost his presidency because of things like that. Uh, <laughs> and a woman ended up in the seat behind him, you know? So uh, it's still a rough field. It's still a rough field for us. Do you think, I, I've kind of, I've heard a few times that, that I, I don't want to offend anybody by saying this, but that surgeons are more the um, performer or virtuoso among medical um, absolutely. professions. Do you think that has something to do with it? Yes, absolutely okay. it does. I, yeah. That's what I was trying to bring out in that slide. I was going to say prima donna. There, but. Is, <laughs> there is definitely a unique personality type. You have to be able to walk into a trauma where there's five gunshot wounds, blood everywhere, head pouring out, you know, all kinds of pressures, and, and take control of the situation and honestly believe you can make this better by cutting them open, okay? There's definitely a personality type that goes with that type of bravado. And uh, it's maybe not the most common characteristic you'll find in women, but it's much more common now than it was then. There is a certain uh, development of almost male traits in women today that didn't exist 30, 40 years ago. I, I guess what I was thinking too was that a, a male who has those characteristics would certainly fight off anybody else who would threaten that. That probably yeah. certainly had a, a, an effect as well on yes. women rising. So You're right. Yeah. You're right. That's probably why our salaries are lower. We don't negotiate either. You know, A man's going for the job and he's going to negotiate that salary. Okay, That's really important. And women tend to avoid that kind of conflict. And so we accept what's given as opposed to demanding more. What's the culture at Brody like compared to Massachusetts, and what, what are some of your experiences here? Um, well, I've only been here for nine months, and I have been um, very pleased. The department chair is, is Mike Rotundo, and Dr. Rotundo, from the very beginning of me walking in here, said we need to improve the culture for women surgeons here. We want women residents to think this is a great place to be. You need to tell me what we're doing wrong, if we're doing something wrong, so we can make it better. And we have recruited two new women faculty since I've been here. And uh, last year in the match, so we have a match system for naming surgical residents, there were no, none of the five categoricals that matched here were women. And three of the five that matched last week are women. So um, I don't think that there was a negative uh, as much as not necessarily uh, knowing how to make it inviting. Okay, um, the women surgeons have met several times this year and just had a little social where we get to know each other and mentor each other and sort of give each other advice on things and, and that has changed the culture a little bit and it's going to be little incremental changes. We're bringing in women to give grand rounds and that, uh, you know, just putting very prominent, nationally known, competent, excellent people out there who can be role models and, and others can look at, medical students can look at and say, yeah, I, I can do that. Um, we'll, ch we'll continue to change the culture. Um, I would say that compared to, um, it, it's, it's much less abrasive than where I was at, when I was at Harvard, but I was at Harvard 17 years ago. Um, and uh, and uh, compared to my prior job, it's, it's a big improvement. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. Did you have a female surgeon role model? I mean, why did you choose surgery? Uh, you know, <laughs> some mother wanted some, me to be a dermatologist. Um, well, I mean, sometimes people say, you know, there was some, there was this person who, who. You know, I think it's that personality thing. I think that um, you're a tr you, your personality traits choose your field more than you choose your field. Um, when I, I started medical school, I said I was. I was probably going to do anything but be a surgeon because I wanted to be a mom and I wanted to be a wife and I wanted to have a life. And um, surgeons aren't really well known for their work-life balance. Um, and then I did my surgery uh, rotation my third year of medical school. And from the very first day, I walked into an operating room and watched someone be opened, treated, and closed and recover. I knew that if I was going to be stuck in the hospital at 3 o'clock in the morning that I wanted to be doing the actual fixing. Um, I get that immediate gratification. You know, the conjoined twins. You plan for a long time, but when you separate them and they're in two separate beds, you know you did it, you know? You know, it's just that, that gratification is really important to me. Any other questions? In that case, thank you very much. Thank you.